All right, so I'm just going to um, address a question uh, from one of the students before I formally begin my review. Okay, so let's suppose that we're given the intersection of two planes. Uh, it doesn't really matter, so let's just say it's x minus 2y minus 3z is 0. And then let's say we've got another one, which is maybe 2x uh, plus, let's see here. Okay, so let's do, oh, I'll do minus 3y um, plus 5z equal to 0. Okay. So each equation represents a plane right now. So when we find the solution to this system of equations, uh, that will correspond to the intersection of the two planes. And we kind of know geometrically that uh, with two planes, uh, if they intersect, then they are going to intersect in a line. So we can already anticipate that the solution to the system of equations is going to be a line, meaning it'll be one dimensional, meaning it's going to involve one free variable. Okay. Uh, but if I were to find uh, like what is the intersection of the two planes, that means I want to find what the solution to this system of equations is. And the way we usually find a solution to a system of equations is to do the usual row operations. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of elimination right now. It's a small matrix, so we won't have to do too much. So I'm gonna start with uh, row two minus two row one. Uh, so what is that going to do for me? So adding four is going to give me one. And here adding six will give me 11. And it's not that important, but I'll go ahead and do one more row operation to get it into the uh, reduced row echelon form. Okay. It's not necessary, but I just think it might be a little bit nice. So then I'm going to get 1, 0, 0, 1. And then we're going to add 22. So it's going to give me 19. OK? All right, so um, our usual procedure is to say, OK, so we've got pivots in the first and second columns. And then the third column is missing a pivot. So because the third column is missing a pivot, we're going to say, okay, Z will be a free variable. So then we're going to uh, parameterize. So assign a parameter to Z. And then here we have um, X plus 19Z is zero. And we've got y plus 11z is 0. So you would get y is negative 11t. And then x would be negative 19t. Uh, and then t, of course, would be uh, any real number. And then at this point, if we were looking for a basis uh, for the intersection of these two planes, uh, do you know what you would do at this point then? <laughs> 
Yeah, if you factor out the T, just like how we've done before, then here we're seeing that um, our solutions are going to be um, all multiples of this one single vector. Okay. So then uh, this vector will give us a basis uh, for the intersection of our two planes. Okay. And then the intersection of our two planes, that would have been the uh, null space of our matrix, uh, this being the matrix A, okay? So just connecting it to things that we've been talking about, because uh, literally the intersection of the two planes, so it was the solution set to the system of equations but this system of equations is also of the form like AX equals zero. And remember that the solutions to this equation were what we defined to be the null space of the matrix A. Okay, so uh, yeah, okay. All right, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started with the review. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to talk some more about the uh, fundamental subspaces of a matrix. So I started it at the end last time. It was a little bit rushed, I feel like though. So I'm gonna go over it again there wasn't really too much to cover this week, so it's actually a good opportunity for me to review a bit more. So let's first recall um, what the four fundamental subspaces of a matrix are. Okay, so this works for any size matrix. So just like a generic M by N matrix A. Uh, first, we have the column space of A, which is defined to be the span of the columns of A. And so that's the definition of the column space. And one of the most important properties of the column space, one that we've been using um, a lot so far this semester, and that one that we're going to continue to use for a little bit longer. So remember that. Um, an equation of the form AX equals B will have a solution uh, if and only if the vector B is in the column space of A. So that's one of the important properties to know for the column space. Uh, next, we had the uh, null space of A. And let's remember the null space of A was the uh, space of solutions to the equation AX equals zero. There you go. Uh, and then after the column space and the null space, we had the, the column space of A transpose and then the null space of A transpose. So the column space of A transpose is also known as the row space of A. Uh, 
So the idea is the rows of A are the columns of A transpose, so it makes sense. So you could think of it as being the span of the rows uh, of A, okay? And then finally, the left null space. Uh, that's another name for the null space of A transpose. Um, let me quickly just talk about why we, we call it the left null space. That's not super important, I suppose, but I guess it's worth seeing. OK, so if uh, a vector y is in the null space of A transpose, so remember that by definition, definition of null space, that means that y satisfies this equation, that A transpose times y equals 0. All right, now, uh, recall a property about transpose is that uh, when you transpose a product, you can transpose each term uh, individually, but you also have to like reverse the order that they were written in. Okay, so if I were to uh, transpose both sides of this equation, so zero transpose is still going to be zero. It'll be a different size, but still zero. And if I apply this rule to the um, transposing A transpose A, so it's going to be Y transpose first, and then A transpose transpose second. And of course, A transpose transpose is just A. Right. So if Y is in the left null space, then here we kind of see how it kind of looks like if you multiply A on the left by the vector Y, that you're going to get 0. So that's why it's the left null space of A. OK? So just a little bit of an explanation on that terminology there. Okay. Now I talked about how to find uh, bases for each of the four fundamental subspaces of a matrix. Uh, I, I did that at the very end last time. And again, as I was saying, it was a bit rushed. So I'd like to just like do another problem of that sort right now. And then I'll also talk a little bit more as I go along this time. OK, so we're going to find bases for the uh, fundamental subspaces of the following matrix. All right. <clears throat> And so if you're finding uh, the bases for the fundamental subspaces of a matrix, uh, what you'll want to do is you'll want to start row reducing your matrix. And for me personally, I uh, find it easiest to reduce all the way to the reduced row echelon form. Uh, it's not necessary. Um, any row echelon form would be good enough 
but if you read all the way to the reduced root echelon form, it makes uh, some parts of it a little bit easier, I feel like. Okay, so personally, I would just go to the RREF. <clears throat> now, are you comfortable with how to find the RREF of a matrix? Okay, so let's just uh, skip to the end result then, since we don't need to see that. All right, so it should be one zero 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 one zero zero uh one negative one zero zero uh zero zero one zero and then zero two one zero okay all right um so I'll circle where all the pivots were, so you have pivots here, here, and here. Okay. So pivots in the first, second, and fourth columns right now. Okay, so let's start by getting a basis for the column space of A. So if you just remember how this works, since the first, second, and fourth columns have the pivots in them, I'm gonna take the first, second, and fourth columns, but from the original matrix. And then these will give me a basis for the column space of A, okay? Okay, so if we take a look at the third and the fifth columns, okay. so notice that the third column, uh, zero minus one minus two one, so it was actually equal to one times the uh, first column of A, and then minus one times the second column of A. And then if I were to look at the fifth column of A, so notice that this should be equal to two times the second column of A. And then plus one of the fourth column of A. All right, and uh, do you know how I was able to uh, see this so easily? Yeah, so how is it that I was uh, able to see that the third and fifth columns were these combinations of the first, second, and fourth? Like, would you be able to have seen that uh, pretty easily? Okay. So this is um, something that you've kind of seen before, uh, but we actually can see this just by looking at the RREF. So because in the third column, we have the numbers one and negative one, uh, we can use that as the coefficients over here and use it to write out um, the third column as a combination of the first two columns, okay? And then likewise in the 
fifth column, uh, if we use the numbers here as the coefficients, so we had like the number zero to one. So zero times the first column plus two times the second, and then plus one times the fourth uh, gives us the fifth column, okay? So when you have a column that's missing pivots, um, that will indicate that the original column was a linear combination of the like original pivot columns. And because the third and the fifth were combinations of the first, second, and fourth, that's why we were able to just like drop them from A. And that leaves us with just the first, second, and fourth columns in the end, giving us the basis for the column space of A, all right? So that was just a little bit more of an explanation as to why we end up choosing the pivot columns, the first, second, and fourth in this case. The non-pivot columns will be linear combinations of the pivot columns. And you can see how that works here. <clears throat> yeah, okay, so for that one, uh, so it comes from the coefficients that we had here, zero to one. So the zero would be the coefficient of our first um, pivot column. Two will be the coefficient of our second pivot column. And then we'd use one for the coefficient of our third pivot column. Okay. And then here you can see that if you were to add these up that you would in fact get what we had in the fifth column, one, zero, one, zero, okay? Now, can you see that now? Yeah, this only works if you reduce it to the REF though. So if you just go to like a regular REF, you won't be able to see how to write the non-pivot columns as combinations of the pivot columns uh, so easily. So this is one advantage to the REF over like a regular REF, okay? <clears throat> okay, now, if it just asks for a basis for the column space, you don't really need to do this stuff though. But this is just me kind of showing you uh, why we only take the pivot columns uh, to get a basis for the column space. Oh, so next I'll look at the row space, which we often write as R of A. At least in this class, we write it as R of A. Okay, so to get a basis for the row space, what you can do is just take each row with a pivot in the reduced matrix, or if you will, then just take each of the non-zero rows, because those are the rows that will have pivots in them. Uh, take them and just write them as um, columns, because we usually write vectors as columns. So this will give you a basis for the row space. OK. So just talking, I just want to talk a little bit about how that works. <clears throat> so when you're doing row operations, uh, you're really just, say like when you add a multiple of a row to another row, for instance, uh, adding a multiple of a row to another row is just going to give you like a linear combination of the two rows that you are using. So when you're doing row operations, you're just uh, replacing rows of A with like linear combinations of the rows. And so when you're doing the row operations, you're actually uh, not changing the row space. 
at the matrix. Right. So every time you perform a row operation on a matrix, the resulting matrix will have the same row space. And because of that, that's why we can take the basis for the row space from the reduced matrix as opposed to the original matrix, because they actually both will have the same row space. Okay. And then with the way that the like pivots are kind of structured in the row echelon form, uh, they're always going to be independent. So then that way you're going to get a basis uh, for the row space just by taking the uh, non-zero rows, or if you will, the rows with pivots, all right? So that's just a little bit uh, of a comment on how that works. Uh, if we talk about getting a basis for the null space, So that's going to be analogous to what we actually did in that first example uh, over here. So remember that the null space is the solutions to AX equals zero. So now that we've reduced our matrix, uh, if we take each of the rows from the REF and write out like the corresponding system of equations that we get from them, So the second row gives us x2 minus x3 uh, plus 2x5. And we set it equal to 0 for the null space. And then the third row gives us uh, 1x4 plus x5 equals 0. OK? All right. So we're going to choose x3 and x5 to be the free variables because third and fifth columns were not or did not have a pivot. So then we do the usual thing where we parameterize each of our free variables. And then we're going to solve for the remaining variables in terms of the parameters. So here we'd have x4 is negative t, x2 is 1s minus 2t, and x1 is just going to be negative t. <clears throat> now, if you reduce it all the way to the RREF, then getting the null space is going to be really simple, like this. Uh, if you stopped at a just like an REF, but not like a RREF, then you would need to do a little bit of back substitution here. So it would be a little bit more complicated, uh, but you would still do it um, fairly easily still. OK? But yeah, if you go all the way to REF, this part is going to be a little bit easier. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, my computer froze a little bit there, which is why there was a somewhat long pause. But yeah, x1 should be negative s. So yeah, thank you. Uh, a small word of warning, my computer seems to freeze rather frequently um, now. Uh, when I'm switching back and forth between e-learning and OneNote, it seems to freeze a little bit often. So uh, just bear with me. It usually doesn't last that long uh, if it does happen. All right, and then uh, what we want to do is write this out, but in a, a vector format. And we want to specifically write out the right-hand side as a linear combination using our parameters as the coefficients. 
So I think the easiest way to do it is to just read off the coefficients of s. And that gives you this first vector. And then read off the coefficients of t. And that gives you the second vector. OK? All right. Uh, so s, t could be any real number. And this will give you uh, the set of all solutions to the null space um, which would then constitute the null space. Uh, but if you just wanted a basis for the null space, the basis for the null space would just consist of just these two vectors. Okay. Yeah, so these two vectors are the basis for the null space. And if you take all linear combinations of them, that would then give you the entire null space, okay? Uh, I know I talked about it before, but I just think it's kind of nice to see. So in this example, you see that the null space is spanned by two vectors. So when you have two vectors, um, you kind of understand that they're gonna span a plane so we can kind of see geometrically what the null space looks like. Uh, we see that the null space is, in this example, is going to be a plane. Uh, but it's a plane in R5, because uh, we see that our vectors have five components to them. OK? All right. All right, but then finally, let's talk about how to get a basis for the left null space. So I talked about it last time, but I didn't actually do it uh, in the example that I squeezed in at the end. So let's actually do it for this example. All right, so in order to get a basis for the null space, uh, you can't get that so um, easily or so straightforwardly from the RREF. It's going to take a little bit of work to get it. Uh, but here's what we're going to do. So we could just transpose A and then just find the null space the way that we did with A itself. But there's a small simplification that we can do. So instead of looking at the entirety of uh, a transpose, which here I'm just going to write it out. So I'm going to write each of the columns of A as a row to get A transpose. So that was the second column of A. This is the third column of A. Uh, fourth column was negative 1, 0, negative 3, 0. And then the fifth column was one, zero, one, zero. So we could take a transpose and do the row operations to try to find its null space. But there's a simplification that we can do to the uh, procedure. Uh, which is that I'm just going to sort of delete the third and the fifth rows right now. Uh, so let's talk about why I was able to do that. <clears throat> so recall that the and third and fifth columns of A were linear combinations okay, of the first, second, and fourth. And then the columns all became rows here. So that means the third and fifth rows were combinations of the first, second, and fourth. So when you do your row operations, you know they would just go to zero. So you can actually just remove them from your matrix. And that way, it's a little bit easier because you have a smaller matrix to work with. 
so I guess sort of. Uh, it is because ultimately um, they were the columns in A that did not have the pivots in them. And so I guess the actual explanation would be that the third and fifth columns were combinations of the first, second, and fourth. So when you're doing row operations, you would just end up eliminating them and making them all zero throughout uh, when you do your row operations. And because they would just turn into rows of zeros, they don't really affect uh, getting the null space. So you can just ignore them. Okay. OK, and so then from here, we're going to find the north of this matrix. And that will give us uh, the north space of a transpose. And I guess I'll do the, go through the formal procedure of putting this into RREF. Uh, I didn't actually write out what the RREF was for this one, so I'm going to do that just real quickly. So row two minus row one and row two plus row one is what I'm going to do first. Okay, so then here's my next pivot. So I'm going to go ahead and do add row two to row one and also row three to make these zeros. Uh, here we're going to get 2 and negative 1. Oh, whoops. Here we're going to get oh, 0 and 0. And I guess I'll um, eliminate. Oh, let's see here. So multiply the third row by negative 1. And then let's just eliminate these two, and that will give us the uh, RREF. All right, great. So then. <clears throat> That gets me the following system of equations. So x1 is 0. That's the first row. Uh, the second row is x2 minus x4 equals 0. And third row says x3 is 0. OK? All right. So we had pivots in first, second, and third columns. So x4 will be our choice of free variable. Okay, since the fourth column was missing a pivot, so we'll assign a parameter to x4. And then here we have x3 is actually just a 0. Uh, x2 is t, and we get x1 is, well, 0. So when you factor out the t, you're going to get 0, 0, 1. So this single vector by itself is going to give us the basis for the left null space, OK? Uh, let's check. Did I mess that one up? I might have messed it up. Um, yeah, so I guess over here, when I did row 3 plus row 2, because um, um, it was a 2 and a negative 3, so it looks like I would have gotten negative 1. And then I just multiplied by negative to make it plus. OK? So it looks like it would have been negative 1 and not 5, all right? Uh, but just even like 
um, if it is supposed to be five, um, I think you still get the idea though of like how to get the, yeah, no problem. Uh, the important thing is that you understand the procedure though for getting the basis for the left null space if you need to, okay? All right, so now I'm going to take a look at a couple of things in this example, and uh, we're going to make a couple of observations, okay? So I'm going to scroll back up. All right, now uh, I want to talk about the rank of a matrix, which I talked about before, but I want to talk about it again. Uh, so you guys probably um, know that the rank of a matrix is equal to the number of pivots. So in this case, it's going to be equal to three, okay? Now remember that we get a basis vector for the column space from each of the pivots. And then remember that the dimension of a space was equal to the number of vectors in any basis for that space. So that means that the dimension of the column space of a matrix will also be equal to the rank of A Uh, because the number of vectors that you get in the basis will be equal to the number of that you had. And then it's the same for the row space as well, because we also get one basis vector in the row space for each pivot. Okay. Uh, and then, yeah, in this case, the rank would be three, okay? Now let's take a look at the null space as well next. All right, so here the dimension of the null space, in this example, it would be two-dimensional. Okay. Uh, so, one way of seeing how that works is it's because we had two free variables, which led to having these two parameters. And that's why we had these two vectors in the end and the basis. So you can think of the dimension of the null space as being the number of free variables that you have. All right, but then remember that we get a free variable for each column that is missing a pivot. So in other words, the number of free variables is also the number of columns uh, that did not have pivots, so without pivots. And then I want to combine that with an observation that we made about the rank of a matrix. So notice that the, so the rank of A, uh, if you think about it as the number of pivots, but you can also think of it as the number of columns without pivots, because that would essentially count the same thing. So you can think of rank as the number of columns with pivots. And then we just talked about how the dimension of the null space uh, is going to be the number of columns without pivots. So if we add the two of these together, so if you take the number of columns with pivots, 
and you add to that the number of columns without pivots, uh, what are you going to get? Mm -mm. <clears throat> but if you take the columns without pivots and then take the columns with pivots and you add their numbers together, uh, well, that's just going to give you the total number of columns in the matrix, right? All right, so this seems like a really simple observation, uh, but it's actually a pretty big, important result, if you will, in linear algebra. So I'm definitely going to highlight that because of it. Um, now, I don't think you guys use this terminology, but if you're maybe uh, reading like out of another textbook or like some other reference for this class. The dimension of the null space of A, um, some people call that the nullity of A. And then this theorem here would be referred to as the uh, rank nullity theorem. Uh, that's a hyphen, not a minus sign. So rank nullity theorem just talks about how the rank of a matrix, the nullity of the matrix will equal the total number of columns in that matrix, okay? All right, so uh, I'll try to use that result actually in an example that I'm gonna do later uh, today. Uh, but right now I'm going to uh, do another example first. All right, so in this example, uh, let's say we're given the following matrix A. Yeah, okay, so yeah, this is, uh, I guess, what uh, you guys are referring to as an LR factorization, okay? Uh, so if you're wondering what an LR factorization is, it's basically just like an LU factorization, uh, which you've done before. Uh, only difference is your matrix A was not a square matrix. So you can't reduce it to upper triangular form. So you're not getting like a usual U here. But if you reduce your matrix to like a row echelon form, so that would be like your uh, analogous to your upper triangular matrix from before, uh, but they're calling it R for like row echelon form now. So then this is like the LR factorization, just like the LU, but for rectangular matrices, you can say. Okay. 
All right. <clears throat> um, before I continue with the example, maybe uh, were you wondering how you would find an LR factorization of a matrix? Yeah, basically the same way you do LU. It's just instead of getting a U, you got to get an R. Okay, all right. So let's say we're given the matrix A, but what we're really given is like an LR factorization of it. And let's say we want to find bases uh, for the fundamental subspaces of A. Um, and we're going to do it without uh, multiplying out these matrices. So without really uh, figuring out what the matrix A was, OK? Okay, so it's um, actually not that difficult. Uh, it's kind of easy actually, because uh, if you just understand that the R here is actually an REF of A, so you can actually get bases for the uh, fundamental subspaces of A, just now that you can see that this is the row echelon form, okay? Let me start by considering the uh, column space of A. So from the REF, we see that it was the first and second columns have the pivots. So that tells you that the first and second columns of uh, matrix A would form a basis for the column space. Okay. And so we can actually recover what the first and second columns of A were without multiplying out um, all of L and R to get the original A. So the first column of A Uh, keep in mind how matrix multiplication works. So the first column of the product, you would get by taking L times the first column of R. And we can recover the second column of A uh, just by taking L and multiplying it with the second column of R, okay? So we just need to do these two real quickly, so let's do that. So here's L, and we're just gonna multiply with the first column of R. And then same thing, we're gonna take L and multiply with the second column of R. And if we did that, yeah, give me one second. That should have been the second column of A. So then these two vectors should give us a basis. Uh, for the column space of A. So we were able to get that without multiplying out L and R. 
we did a little bit of it, but we didn't do the entire thing. Okay. Yeah, so you shouldn't actually multiply them all out. You shouldn't actually try to find what the matrix A was, okay? So here I've only found the first and second columns of A, uh, but I haven't actually figured out what the entire matrix is yet, and I'm not going to, okay? All right, so we got that. Um, to get a basis for the row space of A, So it talks about how you can get it just by taking the non-zero rows from the RREF. Uh, that works for any REF though. So I'm just gonna take the non-zero rows that we had here in the REF. And that will be enough for a basis for the row space. Okay, and uh, again, I'm writing it as columns rather than rows as they originally were, uh, partly because vectors are typically thought of as columns, but I guess also partly because this is actually the column space of A transpose. Uh, so they, you would actually be thinking in terms of columns uh, for that, okay? All right, uh, so you get a basis for the null space, Uh, so actually, because you have the REF already, uh, you can use it now to solve the AX equals zero equation uh, in order to uh, get the uh, null space. So this was the first row of the REF. So it's gonna give us this equation. This was the second row of the REF. So it gets us the equation x2 minus three x3 minus x4 equals zero. And the third and fourth columns were the ones with pivots in them. So we're gonna go ahead and choose the third and fourth variables to be our free variables then. Uh, so we'll do x3 is s, we'll do x4 is t. Uh, and then here we can solve for x2 right now. So it'd be 3s plus t. All right, now when I'm trying to solve for x1, um, notice that I'll need to do some back substitution. We play, sub this in for x2. So the reason why I'm having to do this back substitution is because it was only in uh, REF and not in RREF. Uh, so as you've seen in my other examples, if it is in RREF, you'll find that you don't need to do any back substitution and you'll just be able to like straight away solve for your remaining variables. Okay. Uh, but let's see here, x1, we've got 6s minus s, move it over, so it'll be minus 5s and 2t, 4t, so minus 4t. Okay? And uh, if I just wanted a basis for the null space, uh, then you can ultimately get it just from the coefficients of s. and the coefficients of t. Okay. So we've got that now. And then the last one, which is always a little bit harder than the others. Uh, getting a basis for the left null space. <clears throat> So we talked about how we did it before in the previous example. 
So you could look at a transpose and find its null space, but uh, you don't need to consider uh, all of the rows of a transpose. Uh, you only need to consider the um, first and second rows of a transpose, because it would have been the first and second columns of a, which were the uh, basis columns in the column space. So just take the first and second columns of A that we found here. Put them into another matrix as rows. You don't need the other rows of A transpose because they're just going to go to zero when you do your row operations. So I'm just going to take this and uh, just find its null space, and that would be the null space of A transpose. Okay. So I'd start by row reducing and so forth in order to find the null space. Uh, but I think I'll, instead of finishing this, I'll go ahead and just kind of end it there, uh, figuring you guys know how to find the null space by now, and so you'd be able to get a basis for the null space here. Okay. All right, so just uh, any questions about that example? Okay. So uh, there's one last thing that I uh, want to talk about. I guess it's kind of two things, but whatever. Uh, so I want to talk about the notion of um, orthogonal complements. Or I guess uh, we'll say orthogonal complement of a subspace. All right, so let's say uh, I have um, oh, okay. I'll use V. So let's say that V is a subspace uh, of uh, some Rn, okay? So it could maybe be like a plane in R3 or something like that. It's so some subspace of some Rn. So the orthogonal complement of V, so we notate it with this notation V, and then we have like a perpendicular sign for the superscript. Uh, this is usually read as a V perp. It's kind of like V perpendicular, OK? Uh, but it's the orthogonal complement of V, and it is defined to be the set of all vectors uh, in Rn, in Rn uh, that are orthogonal. to every vector in V. So that's the definition of the orthogonal complement. Uh, some good uh, visual examples is if V is the, let's say V is the xy plane, or actually, I'll even go a little bit easier first. So if we say like the x-axis and say like R2, okay, so that would be V here, the x-axis. So if you look at what are all the vectors that are orthogonal to V, well, that would be precisely all the vectors that are along the y-axis, okay? Uh, 
So that means the orthogonal complement of V would be the Y axis in this example. And I guess kind of similarly, um, if V is the uh, X, Y plane in R3, So I don't quite know how to say, so you can imagine this is me shading in just the X, Y plane. So the vectors which are perpendicular to the X, Y plane are those vectors which are pointing purely in the uh, positive or negative Z directions. So that means the orthogonal complement of V in this example would have been the Z axis, okay? So those are just some kind of simple examples that you can visualize. Uh, a fact about um, orthogonal complements. Maybe I'll state a few facts. <clears throat> uh, so first, uh, any, well, okay, so first, the orthogonal complement of any subspace B is going to be a subspace itself. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, for any subspace B and its orthogonal complement, uh, v and V perp, they will have uh, no vectors uh, in common uh, aside from the zero vector. So what I mean by that is like here, uh, no vector in V is going to be a vector in V perp. And no vector in V perp is going to be a vector in B, uh, except uh, they always have to pass through the origin because there are subspaces. Uh, aside from the zero vector, they're not going to have any other vectors in common. Um, for those of you who are familiar with like a set notation, uh, we're saying V intersects with its orthogonal complement is only the zero vector. Uh, but if you're not familiar with set notation, that's not too important. Uh, thirdly, and this is maybe uh, one of the more important facts, is that the dimension of V plus the dimension of its orthogonal complement will always equal the dimension of the space that they were in. So assuming that I'm working in Rn, then their dimensions are always going to add up to be n, OK? You can at least see that in the example. So here, v and v perp were both lines, sort of both one dimensional. So if you add the dimensions, you're going to get uh, 1 plus 1 is 2. Here, v was a two-dimensional subspace in R3. Its orthogonal complement was a one-dimensional subspace. Two plus one gets you three. Okay. All right, so that's just a couple of facts. And then uh, let's take a look at the uh, fundamental subspaces of a matrix. So I'm going to consider the uh, row space of a matrix right now. Uh, 
which was the column space of H transpose. Uh, and I'm going to consider the null space. And I want to, OK, so what I want to show is that first, um, the row space of a matrix and the null space of a matrix, these are going to be orthogonal complements of each other. OK. Uh, maybe I'll quickly say one more fact here. Um, diagonal complement of the diagonal complement of V is just V itself. Okay. Okay. But yeah, so I want to say that the real space and the null space of a matrix are orthogonal complements. Uh, so let's understand why that would be the case. I don't need a big example. So I'm just going to use a two by two matrix to just illustrate how it works. So let's suppose that this vector X is in the null space of this matrix A, so that A times X gives me zero right now, OK? Now, if you think about how the matrix vector multiplication works, uh, this first entry you get by taking the first row of A and doing a dot product with the vector X, right? So this is saying that if you take the first row of A, oops, and you do a dot product with X, you're getting zero. OK, same with row two as well. And you can generalize to like other size matrices as well, OK? What this shows then is that for a vector to be in the null space, it has to be orthogonal to all of the rows of A. Because remember, dot product being 0 means they're orthogonal. So in that sense, you see that um, any vector in the null space is orthogonal to all the rows of A. And hence, it'll be orthogonal to the entire row space. Okay. And then uh, for a vector to be in the null space, it has to be orthogonal uh, to all the rows of A to get zeros everywhere. So then in that sense, the null space, you can see is the orthogonal complement of the row space. And then therefore, vice versa would be true that the row space is the orthogonal complement of the null space. Uh, something that we saw earlier was, uh, I talked about the rank nullity theorem, which was that the, the rank of a matrix uh, which was the same as the dimension of the row space, as well as the column space. There's also the number of pivots. And then plus the dimension of the null space. I talked about how that's equal to the total number of columns of the matrix. OK. So if A is M by N, it would have N columns, so you'd have that. So this fact that the dimension of the row space of A plus the dimension of the null space will equal the number of columns in A, that's actually sort of a restatement of uh, this third fact that I stated up here. OK. All right, and then And then the row space was a column space of A transpose. So if I just swap A and A transpose everywhere, so instead of the column space of A transpose, I consider just the column space of A. And instead of the null space of A, I consider the null space of A transpose. That's going to be a similar story that these are also orthogonal complements of each other. <clears throat> 
And this fact is going to be important when we talk about projections, which I will do in the next view. Uh, so keep this fact in mind because I'm going to use it next time. And I'm kind of um, over time right now, but I would like to squeeze in one final relatively quick example, okay? Uh, so let's say that I have a matrix A, which is size uh, two by three. Okay. And so let's see here. It'll look something like this. <clears throat> All right. So let's say that I'm given that. And let's say I'm also given that the null space of A is a uh, one dimensional. And then from just this information, I want to um, talk about the other subspaces, the other fundamental subspaces of A. So I want to talk and describe like what look like, what they would be. <clears throat> uh, so let's see what we could say about the other fundamental subspaces. Uh, so let's see here. Since my matrix A is size two by three, um, in order to multiply with a vector, it would have to have three components. So that means the null space is going to be a line because it's one dimensional. And it's going to be an R3 uh, because if you have like AX equals zero, the X has to be three by one. So it's an R3. Um, this isn't maybe too important, but I'll go ahead and emphasize it. So it's a little line R3. It is going to be a line passing through the origin. Uh, it has to be because it's a subspace. Remember that any subspace of Rn is going to have to pass through the origin because subspaces always have to have the zero vector in them, okay? So if the null space of A is a line in R3. Uh, I know that the row space of A is the orthogonal complement of the null space. So that tells you that the row space of A, all right, so first I know that their dimensions have to add up to be three since they're gonna be in R3. So I could conclude that the row space of A is gonna be a plane uh, in R3, also passing through the origin because it's the subspace. Uh, but I can also say that it's a plane in R3 and it will be uh, orthogonal uh, to the line, which is the null space. Okay. Um, and then let's see here. The rank of A was two dimensional. So the column space of A would also have to be two dimensional as well then. Because remember the dimension of the column space and row space, those are both equal to rank of A, uh, which was also the number of pivots. Let's see, in this case, the when you look at the columns of A, the columns of A are already going to be vectors in R2. So that tells me that um, the column space of A, it's a two-dimensional subspace within R2. So it has to be all of R2 then, okay? Uh, 
Uh, and then I'm thinking about what the left null space would be. So it's going to have to be a just a trivial yeah. subspace. It'll just be origin in R2 and nothing else. Uh, because it was the orthogonal complement of the column space. And the orthogonal complement of R2, you know, what vectors are orthogonal to every vector in R2? That's just a zero vector. Um, and then maybe I can just kind of quickly generalize that, that I guess in general, the orthogonal complement of any Rn is always just going to be the zero vector. Just for what it's worth, that's always going to be the use, okay? All right, but that, that was just like a small kind of fun example, which is a little bit more geometric in nature. Um, I'll come to you next time. I'll maybe do a little bit more with orthogonal complements, uh, but I think next time I'm primarily going to focus on talking about projections, okay?